Okay, where we left off was that we had talked about the y-intercept becoming a local min. Remember that the original 0, 9 was our vertex, and that when we reciprocate that will become 0, 1 over 9, which originally was a max, but then when we graph it, you're going to notice that that reciprocal turned itself into a local minimum. So we're going to see the graph, and that will make more sense to you when we look at the final product. All right, now we need to look at the intervals where the function is positive and negative. So that's what the last part that we looked at. So the intervals that are positive imply that when, so when we look at this, this is the same values that we had in the previous function. And then again, when it's negative, it's in the same intervals with the exception that you have to remember um, that when it's greater than or less than zero, it was the exact same intervals that we had in the last one. So let's just go back to that one for, for just a second. And we're going to go back to the previous screen in just a second so I can explain these last bits. All right, and finally this part, decreasing. It's decreasing when it goes from negative infinity to negative three and from negative three to zero. So that vertical asymptote effects are decreasing because we had to split it up. But if you look at it, this function was originally increasing and now it turns into decreasing. And vice versa. When you had the increasing part from 0 to 3 and 3 to infinity, don't forget this is a vertical asymptote, it was actually decreasing in the same interval. We're going to look at the last question and come back to this in just a sec. So the last question on the previous page, if you look over here, and um, we, we talked about it was increasing from here to here, and now when we did the reciprocal, it was decreasing, and vice versa, where it's decreasing, it was increasing. But the positive and negative intervals did not change. So that's going to be interesting for us to look at. So let's go back to the other page. There we go. At the end of that page, so this is where we left off. This is all the information that we have left off. This is all the information that we need for the graph. Let's actually look at the graph to give us a better idea. So, before we finish that, though, we need to finish the last little bit, and this is important for the graph. These particular points that we're going to find right now are the values where the two graphs actually meet. So, the two graphs will actually meet at a value where when I flip the number, it stays the same. And that number, guys, is number is the number 1 and negative 1. The function equals 1 when 9 minus x squared equals 1. So this is the value of x equals plus or minus 2 root 2. So these are the coordinates. This is the x coordinate. This is the y coordinate. And you're going to see in a minute, now remember, this is the y coordinate. If I flip 1, reciprocal of 1, I get 1 over 1, which remains the same as 1. And the same goes for negative 1. So we're going to find the values when it equals negative 1. And we did. There it is, folks. It equals plus or minus root 10. What does that do for us? Well, we've now found the two values. So the function f at x is equal to g at x at these values. These are the coordinates in which they share the same point, whether it's the original function, which is the parabola, or the reciprocal function, g. These coordinates do not change. All right? So how does that help us? Well, now let's look at the graph and see how the graph will, will uh, be created. So here's our particular graph with all the particular um, uh, coordinates, sorry, the scale. So we need to make sure we hit 9, which is up here, and we have to make sure that we have 3 and negative 3. So those points we need to see. All right, now, and we also need to see when y equals 1, okay? y equals 1 and when y equals negative 1. So this is the original graph, so the parabola. So this is a quick graph of the parabola. And what we're looking at with this parabola is now we're going to graph the new function. 
When we graph the new function, the first thing we're going to look at is one of the uh, vertical asymptotes. So the one vertical asymptote goes here, which is at the zero. The other vertical asymptote goes here, which is at the other zero. We have a horizontal asymptote. Okay, let's look at the equations of the vertical asymptotes. Here we go. We also have a horizontal asymptote. So let's make these asymptotes nice and defined. So there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So let's write that equation in so that we have that. Now, what are the other parts that we need? Well, note this point up here, which was the vertex. Remember what I said the vertex turned into? It turned into 0, 1 over 9. So it moved down here. So this point turned itself around and became this point down here. Next, we have another point over here. This point over here, which is over here, what is this point? Well, remember that at 1, the value for the reciprocal function stays the same as the value of the original function. And then there was one at the other side, which is over here, and that will be the other value. There it is, folks. So how does that help us? Well, we now have what our graph is going to look like. We know that the graph gets closer and closer to each asymptote. So what we have here, essentially, is our graph looking like this. What is this? Well, look here. It's going across here, close to the asymptote, gets closer and closer to this minimum value, and goes back up here on this side. How does that help us? Well, what we've now graphed is our part of our graph. Notice here, the graph is decreasing up to here. The graph originally was increasing. The same place where it was increasing, it's now decreasing. From here to here, the graph was decreasing, so our new function is increasing over here. What else that's neat to look at is the fact that when you look at this particular function, you also notice that this section was where the graph was above zero. It still remained above zero, so that was that positive part that we're talking about. But this isn't the entire graph. Note that we have a graph down here that we need to consider and a graph down here that we need to consider. So how are we going to do that? Well, remember that point that I told you about, that negative 1 point? Remember that the graph hits negative 1 right here? That's the blue graph. Well, that's also where the black graph hits negative 1. So we have a point here. And we know that something in this area has to approach the asymptotes on either side. So this is what we have going on over here. Vice versa, on the other side, we have the exact same thing going on. At the point uh, where y is negative 1, which is, sorry, wait in a second, y is negative 1 right here. We know that the graph is going to go this way and this way. So, how come it goes like that? Well, note that the original function right here was increasing in this section. So we know that when it's a reciprocal, it reverses itself. It's decreasing. It's still going to be a negative value, but now it's decreasing instead of increasing. Same thing goes over here. This section over here, the graph, was decreasing. It flips itself over and becomes increasing, but we also know that the value is still going to remain negative. So the signs of the values don't change. What they do change is whether they increase or decrease, depending on what they originally started as. All right, so the blue graph is our original function. The black graph is our reciprocal function. So this is the final product of the graph of that function that we needed. So let's go over the certain values or certain parameters that we have to keep in mind when we're graphing functions. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the next video 
And the third video is going to go over the brief description in general of how to graph reciprocal linear or reciprocal quadratic functions. Alright, see you in the next video.